You have an old motherboard or OEM system with nothing but PCI slots. What should you get? What if somebody went back and tested over a dozen cards to help you decide? This is Pixel Pipes. Alright, so normally I'd start this video with an in-depth history, maybe talk about the PCI bus, the features of each card, the industry at large, Jensen's clothing habits in the early 2000s, or whatever, you know. Um, but I've already done a few videos about PCI graphics cards, and I've delved into a lot of that already. So instead, we're going to make this short and sweet, and cut right to the good stuff. The sweet creamy center of these delicious glazed graphics delicacies. First with a quick introduction of the cards and then on to the benchmarks. God, I could go for some sweets right now. I have here 12 cards and where possible I've modified the clocks to simulate even more cards for a total of 15. First we'll start with the ones from ATI and AMD and then the Nvidia cards. The first card is a Radeon 9250. This one has 256 megabytes of memory and actually has a 128-bit memory interface. This is the only uh, ATI Radeon card to have that. Uh, that being said, it only supports DirectX 8, so while it will uh, run most of the games and tests that I have, it won't support all of them. So while it does have a 128-bit memory interface, the memory is clocked quite low. Um, there was actually a card faster than this released by ATI. On the PCI bus, you could get a Radeon 9100, which doubles the number of texture units. However, um, I was not able to get one of those in time for this video. They're exceptionally rare, uh, so this will represent the only card of its class from ATI. Next we have the Radeon X1550. Um, this one is also semi-difficult to find, not too bad, but um, I'm actually using this card twice for this uh, for this showdown. It's uh, clocked down a little bit for um, simulating an X1300. It has four pixel pipes either way, and a 64-bit memory interface, as all the rest of the ATI cards do. Then the Radeon HD 3450, uh, which has 40 stream processors and four texture mapping units, four ROPs. This is uh, another one that's used to simulate a second card, the HD 2400 Pro by downclocking the core quite a bit and either way uh, the core specs are going to remain the same. The core that was used between both, uh, both cards is nearly identical. Um, the configuration is exactly the same as well as the architecture so this will simulate uh, both cards uh, perfectly. Lastly for ATI we have the Radeon HD 5450. This one is exceptionally difficult to find nowadays in PCI form. This card and the core configuration were used many times throughout uh, many of ATI's budget offerings, um, rebranded uh, several times usually. Maybe in a couple cases you did have a couple of uh, die shrinks uh, later on, but uh, this is being used to simulate an HD 4350, which is exactly the same. Um, the only difference is a 50, me 50 megahertz slower core clock. The same exact core configuration and architecture was also used for the HD 4550, the 6350, and the 7350. So even though the 7350 would seem to be a GCN uh, generation card. It's actually using the same core as this one right here, uh, the 5450. The same Terascale architecture, the same 80 stream processors. So this is essentially the last and fastest ATI graphics card released on the PCI bus. 
first card from NVIDIA is the GeForce FX 5500. This one has a 64-bit memory interface and 128 megabytes of total VRAM. It has a 250 megahertz core clock, same clock speed as the uh, FX 5200. Uh, versions of the 5500 often come with a 270 megahertz uh, core speed, but um, as you'll see later, there is a reason why it shows the 250 megahertz speed. Then as a counterpart to that FX 5500, I have another one here. This one has a 128 bit memory interface. Uh, so um, just including this one to kind of see as a curiosity how the performance is affected by doubling the bus width. Uh, however, the caveat is that the memory is clocked much slower. The other one has a 400 megahertz clock speed. This one has only 266 megahertz effective clock on its memory. So even though it does have twice the memory uh, bus width that is hampered quite a bit by the lower clock speed. Um, otherwise, the core comes at the same 250 megahertz um, which is why I wanted to clock both cards at the same level. That means, of course, the fill rates and everything else are the same. Then we have the GeForce 6200. This one has a 64-bit memory interface. It's using the same uh, native AGP GPU um, that the uh, AGP version does. So there's no bridge chip on this one, same as the FX series cards. Um, but this one is rather anemic in terms of memory bandwidth and fill rate being only 300 megahertz on the core with four pixel pipes. Then we jump ahead a couple generations to, to the GeForce 6400 GS. Uh, this one is actually overclocked a little bit compared to a reference design. Memory is clocked at 666 megahertz effectively on a 64-bit bus. However, because this is a PCI Express native card, it does have a bridge chip on it. But being that this is the first unified shader architecture, it will be interesting to see how this compares to the 6200. Next, we have the GeForce 9500 GT. This one jumps up quite a bit in terms of specs. Uh, while the clock speeds remain very similar, this one has 32 stream processors, twice as much as the 8400 GS, twice as many texture mapping units at 16, and twice as many ROPs. This one actually is the only other NVIDIA card to have a 128-bit memory interface, which combined with its 800 megahertz uh, speed actually gives it quite a bit of memory bandwidth compared to some of the other cards um, and actually the most memory bandwidth of any of the cards in this lineup. This one is exceptionally difficult to come across. Uh, this was the last card I picked up in this roundup and it took me quite a long time to find so really happy to have this one. Next we have the GeForce 210. This would be the uh, newest card that you can still find on PCI bus. Uh, this has continued to be released and manufactured for uh, a long time. And I actually bought this one brand new. Uh, this actually takes a step backwards though in terms of specs compared to the 9500 GT. It drops right back down to the same specs as the 6400 GS in terms of the 16 stream processors, 8 TMUs, and 4 ROPs. Um, this one runs quite a bit faster though, at least in terms of memory bandwidth, uh, giving this one quite a bit of an edge over the 8400 GS. And then of course we have the famous GT430. This one has the highest specs in terms of the number of stream processors and texture units, 96 stream processors, 16 TMUs, and four ROPs. It has a 64-bit memory interface and of course because it is a modern card like the others it does require a bridge chip there which can sometimes cause issues in performance with certain system configurations. And lastly of course we've got to include the GT520. 
Uh, this card was rebranded as the GT610, but it's, ex it's exactly the same. It has less stream processors than the GT430, 48 stream processors, less TMUs at 8, but the same 4 ROPs. It has higher clocks than the GT430, though. Um, performance, of course, is very unpredictable on the PCI bus. Nonetheless, this is one of the cards, cards that I crowned as the highest performance uh, for the PCI bus, so it will be interesting to see how it stacks up against all the other cards in the lineup. For testing these cards, I've combined the results from two different test platforms, choosing the best results for every card. This means I had to test all 15 cards, real or simulated, across 10 benchmarks twice. This was a lot of testing, as you can imagine. But as discussed in a past video, the platform used makes a big difference to the performance of PCI cards. Please note only the cards shown with an asterisk next to their name use results from the Athlon 64 rig. The rest are from my Core 2 Duo system. For details on the specs of either platform, as well as the drivers used for each card, please refer to the video description below. For our requisite 3 d Mark tests, we start off with 2001 SE, and we see the top performers are kind of unexpected. That is because 3 d Mark 2001 depends more on things like pixel fill rate and memory bandwidth, with other parts of the GPU being fairly underutilized. In 03, we see the 9500 GT once again dominate the top PCI cards from past videos, this time because its fairly robust fill rates are bolstered by having the highest memory bandwidth of the bunch. The GT430 might have more texture and shader throughput, but it's held back by having 25% less memory bandwidth. As you can see, none of the cards from ATI can come even close to Nvidia's best performers. 3 Mark 05 tightens the group much closer together by exerting way more demand than any of these cards can handle. Once again, the 9500 GT bumps up ahead of all other cards by a little bit. And ATI's unified shader cards do a good job at keeping up with the pack. The 9550 doesn't have the DirectX 9 support required to run this test, and the GeForce FX cards could only render screenshots. The first game we've tested in this suite gives every card a chance to render a playable frame rate, with performance largely dictated by the amount of memory bandwidth available on each card, though it can be attenuated by other factors such as pixel and texture fill rates. Newer cards requiring newer drivers may have been adversely affected as optimizations for old games like this cease to be a focus of driver development teams. Serious Sam The Second Encounter places the GT520 at the top, but just under it is a surprise showing from the Radeon 9250. This may be due to the older Catalyst 4.6 driver being particularly well optimized for this game, in addition to the Sirius engine taking special advantage of its architecture. It's a fairly tight race among the rest of the cards, though only the top few offer a really playable frame rate at these settings. UT04 showed amazing performance from the 9500 GT, and it's starting to look like the new king of PCI graphics cards. Without much in the way of shader effects, cards excelling in texture and pixel fill rates have more of a chance to shine. Unfortunately for ATI, none of their cards seem to be able to break out of a 33 frames per second funk, and the age of the driver didn't seem to matter. Halo is one of the few games I've actually included numbers for the 1% lows, though I do apologize for how small the text ended up being. But this gives us an important added dimension to otherwise very strong average frame rates from the top few cards, as performance on PCI cards is often wild and uneven in this game. From Nvidia, only the GT520 and GT430 offer truly smooth performance when used on my Athlon 64 rig, while ATI showed fantastic performance with the 5450 and 4350 with much more consistent frames. The FX cards made me contemplate the purpose of my existence. Half-Life 2 is another great showing from ATI, which despite having much worse theoretical fill rates and bandwidth, easily kept up with Nvidia's strongest cards thanks to their very well-optimized drivers. The Radeon 9250 is running an easier DirectX 8 code path, but overall image quality didn't suffer too much. 
Similar to Halo, Doom 3 shows dramatic scaling across the chart, and it's easy to forget we're even talking about PCI cards. Nvidia will give you a very enjoyable experience, even all the way down to an 8400GS on medium settings, albeit at a very conservative 800 by 600 resolution. ATI struggled a bit, but still managed to stay among the middle of the pack. And lastly, we have Far Cry, with perhaps the weirdest and most frustrating performance issues of any game I've tested. At the bottom of the chart is all of Nvidia's best cards, because no matter what driver I chose or what system I tested them in, they all performed identically to each other with completely abysmal frame rates. The top of the list doesn't make much more sense either, with a couple rather mediocre ATI cards doing rather amazingly well, and faster cards hamstrung with what I can only assume are driver performance issues. And hey, even the FX series gets one last shot at redemption, showing almost playable performance. Yeah, nothing about this game makes sense. So there you go. 15 PCI graphics cards from ATI, AMD, and NVIDIA spanning DirectX 8 all the way up to DirectX 11. It's all been leading up to this. And as you can see, performance scaling across all these PCI cards is rather impressive. Well, not as dynamic as it would have been over AGP or PCI Express, if we were truly and completely bottlenecked by PCI, we wouldn't have seen this sort of scaling. And it truly goes to show that well after the industry largely abandoned PCI, there was still a lot of life left in it. Many of these cards are not going to be easy to find. I spent over a year accumulating this collection for the sake of this video, not just because I hate having money, but because I, you know, I try to make content that I would want to see on YouTube, and I figure there are others like me who want to see it too. While it was a long and intensive project, I'm glad to finally be able to share it all with you, and I hope you all found it informative and at least a little interesting. There are, of course, older PCI cards to cover as well, and that's a possibility in the distant future but many more projects beg to be covered first. So as always, keep it glued to this channel if you want to see more graphics oddities tested, as well as videos covering the history of the 3D consumer industry and more. Thanks for watching, I'm Nathan, and this has been Pixel Pipes.